Folks, it's good to see you this morning. Glad you're here, and uh, we're going to begin worship, and uh, we are we are glad that you have joined us today, and uh, let's do it this way. They're saying I need a microphone because that side folks can't hear me, and so it's good to see you, and uh, let's have a word of prayer, and Jeff and the team is going to lead us, praise God, right? God, we thank you so much that even though it's cold and rainy outside, you rain upon us and you give us your refreshing all the time. We thank you for that. We thank you as we uh, look at your word today. You're going to renew us. You're going to refresh us. And then, Father, that you're going to send us out ready to be all that you want us to be. Father, I pray for Jeff and the worship team that you'll bless them. And then, Father, that you'll anoint them to lead us in worship. And then, Father, I pray that you'll give me your anointing to proclaim your word here in just a few moments. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The love is Good morning, it's good to see you, glad to hear God, it's so, 
so, so, so loving him. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love. And it tells in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he did something for you. He gave his only son for you that if you believe in him, you will not be separated from him forever and forever. But you will have a home with him. Jesus said, I'm going to get a place ready for you. And when it gets ready, I'm going to come back and get you so you can be where I am. Uh, you don't know where that's going to be. That's one reason it's so important uh, to be ready. Uh, you might say, well, what else have God done for me? We're Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says it this way. That while we were still sinners, while we were still fighting God, wanting to do our own thing, saying, God, you're not important to me. Uh, while we were still trying to be good, do, our, do everything our own self, he said he demonstrated his love for you by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Valentine's gift, right? Uh, wrote, uh, First Corinthians says, um, uh, love is patient, love is kind, love does not look out for its own sin, it looks out for the good of others, and it go, doesn't take record of wrongs, and it can go on and on. You know, that's a great way that we can measure our own love. I hope you've had a good Valentine's Day so far. My wife gave me a wonderful, lovely card this morning. I gave her nothing. That's about right. That's about right. I am going to do what? But ask what I am going to do with a little bit. I'm going to pull out the grill and grill after what? You're a musician. I am, but I've been telling you about going to go get a wife or something. I'm a musician. You know what? I'm not. You know, I knew you were going to get your wife or something. I didn't get my wife or something. But she told me she got you something. She got me. I got you. Hey, I mean, you know, you're great to have fun in the Lord and, uh, and stuff. But uh, I am going to grill out steaks in a little while. Uh, if you come back, you can have a snipple, but not a whole lot, okay? If you don't have a lot to go around with, okay? And, uh, but uh, my wife and I have been married 31 years, and uh, it's been 32 years of happiness. And that's how big that out. <laughs> Let's make it up and I get the card, right? Put lots of time. It's working, it's working. Okay. Okay. I know I, I know today is half my day tomorrow is three set up ten five percent off day and that's what I'm waiting for. Okay? What did you say? I said the day is half my tomorrow is seventy five percent off. Okay, we're gonna get most tomorrow. That's right. I can get I can get three times as much tomorrow. That's right, okay. <laughs> Oh, man. Next week we will be having a business meeting, a short business meeting, and uh, because we need to replace an air conditioning unit over in the fellowship hall. Uh, it's so bad. We have been patching and patching and patching, and uh, we've done about the most patching we can do, so we need to take care of that. So uh, our building committee will bring a recommendation next week to uh, replace that and, uh, and, and just um, uh, redo that. And so um, I appreciate them being on there. So we're not using that building a lot. We are. We had a wedding this weekend. Uh, we've had some funeral folks uh, being in there, so we need to take it because we don't know when we're going to have to need it. And so you want to make sure you're ready to uh, vote and help, uh, help take care of business next week, okay? Uh, if you need a copy of budget and uh, budget uh, um, report from last year, we have some in the foyer. If you did not get one last week and if you still need one, make sure you see our finance people and they'll make sure you get one. We also have home watch and something else out there. I don't remember what the other is, and, uh, but um, I'll make sure you pick those up, okay? Let's have a word of prayer and let's, uh, let's continue worshiping. God, thank you. Thank you so much that you show us how to love and follow you. you uh, through our scriptures, you laugh. And Father, through our scriptures, there are times that you do sigh. There are times that you grieve. And Father, through our love life, sometimes we do all three of those. I pray this morning as we look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Father, that you will help us to learn about guarding our hearts, whether we're single, whether we're married, uh, Father, whether we're dating, whether we've taken ourselves off the market. Father, that you'll help us to guard our hearts in you and, uh, and, and honor relationships. And Father, I thank you so much for the message you've given. And Father, I thank you for that. You are our God. You are the one who loves us with an everlasting love. You are the one that we are to model our love for not only our spouses and our loved ones after, but Father, we even can love you the way you love us. So, Father, we ask today that you'll help us to do that in a mighty way. Thank you so much for the going up on our grace name. And, Father, we ask that you'll be with Jeff as he continues leading us. In Jesus' name. And, church, if you're in agreement with that, will you say amen? Or to your horn. The love of God is greater for us.
you so much. Wholehearted, wholehearted um, a worship. Uh, this is at the heart of the relationship with the 
living God. So we need to remember that he is a living God. He is not somewhere down there and uh, one day he's going to resurrect and come back. No, he is, he is a living God. He has always been from everlasting to everlasting. He has always been God. There is never a time that he was not God. And there is never a time that he's going to cease to be God. He is always going to be. In fact, when he incarnated himself here as a man known as Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he came to, to, to reveal himself to us even greater ways because somehow we were not ahead and we were just missing how he had been saying and showing it all along. So he said, I'm going to give you a visible, tangible proof and show you how to do this. And so he is the living God. There are those who said he is so far removed that he, all he did was just spring everything, just throw everything in his face and just let it all work out. And one day I'll come back. No, we don't have a God like that because when he says, I am the Lord, your God, the way that spelled it with all capital letters from the word Lord, it means that I am the God who is ever present with you. There is never a time that, that you have left alone. And so he is the living God. He has your best interest at heart. He first loved us with an everlasting love. And he is so jealous of us that he wants first place in our lives. And yet he will love you enough. Listen to me very carefully. He will love you enough to let you go and see what life will be like without his blessings in your life. God, in his great love for you and for me, he made a covenant of love with us through Jesus Christ. Now, a covenant is different than a contract. A contract, and David and I were in a contract. And, uh, and I did not fulfill my part of the contract. It's null and void. It's over with. He can walk away stop free, or I'll have to pay some balance of that, or something there will be some repercussions upon me. A covenant is much different. A covenant says, if David and I were in a covenant, and I did not hold up my end of the bargain, he picks up until I step back into the picture of him. That's what a covenant does. And uh, when, it, you know, it, he, he, the other person will carry the load of commitment for both of you, and when you come to your senses and return to, to, to God with your whole heart, he restores us to the covenant that he had already established with us. However, the blessings that you would have received when you wandered away, gone forever. You, he doesn't go back and go, oh, well, let's see. Last 10 years, you ran out for the God. I was just held him out and I was giving back to you. He doesn't do that. You've missed them. You've missed them. That's why you ought to stay right down the center of, of walking with God forever and forever. And this the same is true for us in our relationships with our husbands and our wives. I want you to notice verse 2 one more time. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He said, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. No other God did this for you. He's the only one who did this. Therefore, he said, we are to guard our hearts and protect our family. That's what he's getting at over in verse 14 when he says, you shall not commit adultery. Now, the first thing we want to run off is going, well, well, adultery, man, I've heard people say that's an unpardonable sin. It's not. It's not. Adultery is not the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is rejecting Jesus and dying without him. And that's unforgivable. You don't get another chance after you don't read your last. You don't get you don't get to hang out in some waiting room and say, well, I hope my rich aunt or my rich uncle just gives me enough money to get me out of here. I hope somebody likes enough candle to get me out of here. I hope somebody prays me out of here. I hope somebody baptizes right to get me out of here. We don't get that chance. All we get before we die, we get an opportunity to see Jesus. And we reject it. That's not terrible because you don't get a, you don't get a pass on when you get into eternity. But adultery is not, listen to me, adultery is not the unpardonable sin. It is forgivable. But it does leave scars. It's forgivable. But it does leave scars. Some of you have been through a, 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 an adulterous relationship. Maybe uh, your, your former spouse uh, slept around on you, cheated on you. Maybe you were the one that did that. I want you to know something right now. Even though God hates adultery, he loves adulterers. But he doesn't want you to go out and keep doing it. He wants you to come to your senses and say, God, I need to be delivered from that. Somebody described adultery as, as treachery of the worst sort. It's betrayal of the one who needs us the most. And, 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 and listen, 
And it's another one reason for the breakup and failures of marriages today. In the Old Testament, the adulterer received the death penalty. In the New Testament, the adulterer received a, a divorce certificate in, in, in laws of change. In our day, an adulterer would get a, a book down in a talk show on how to have a successful marriage. So it's wrong in that picture today, isn't it? And just because man's laws have changed does not mean that God's laws have changed. Now, I'm not advocating taking an adulterer out here and he can on them and, and stone them to death like they did in Old Testament time. I'm not, I'm not advocating that. But I am saying that I want you to be mindful that adultery in the past and the present still breaks hearts and decimates families. Now, you might be saying, why are you preaching that to us today? Because you influence the others in your circles and, and you can take this to others and minister to them too. If the historians are right in their warnings that the strength and the stability of society are dependent upon the stability of the marriage relationship, then our permissiveness that's running rampant in our society is spreading our own society to do. In the Bible, God has placed guardrails for sex inside and outside of marriage. In fact, outside of marriage, it, it, it's off limits. Don't even do it. In marriage, he says the marriage is kept honorable. And, and when you ride down the highway, and you come into a, a place in the highway that is, is a danger and you can get hurt, what do you find there along the highway, along the side of the road? You find a guardrail. And guardrails are there on the highway, and they're designed to keep a wreck from occurring, and that's exactly what God has done in his holy word. He has placed guardrails for our marriage around sex to keep the wrecks from happening in our marriage. Now, we do know wrecks happen. What should we do? We need to love them. We need to love people. If you was out here and you had a wreck on the interstate, how many would most people just ride by the whole them? They ain't messing with them. Mm -mm. They ain't getting over there, but they go. They should have brought that, they should have brought that stuff. No, we don't, we want that. We want not somebody to do that if we break that down the highway. Nor should we treat people that way when they have failure in their marriage. We need to love them. We need to help people guard their heart. That's one of the reasons I need with young couples as we get ready to get married. I, I even have the older couples when they, when they come in and say, I want to get married. And I, I do the same kind of stuff I do with the young couple. Even though they've already had marriages and relationships, I, I still talk with them about tools to make their marriage successful. How to guard their heart. And see, those guardrails that God gives us, it applies to sex before marriage, and again, God says sex outside of marriage is off limits and don't do it. He gives guardrails for sex during marriage, and He also gives us guardrails for sex after marriage. He said, after marriage, the yeah, after your spouse dies, the same rules that apply to non married people. Apply to those whose spouses have already passed. Sex is off limits. I have stories I can tell you about what they say. Brothers and sisters, and others who are worshiping with us, I want you to listen to something carefully. God is for you, and He is not against you. He wants you to succeed even in love and madness of the heart. His laws are not burdensome, nor are they uh, to be a wet blanket on your life, but they are designed to guard your heart, even with the goal of having a winning marriage. Many of us are disturbed in our homes, somebody said. Many of us are disturbed in our home because rather than being married by the justice of the peace, it looks like we've been married by the Secretary of War. I've known men and women, maybe that fuss and fight. I've had couples that um, sit on my couch and they are going through and, and, and one sweating the horse and the other just trying to figure out why did the world happen. And I'll ask, I'll ask her because usually she's done fed up with the stuff that the man has done. And I'll ask her, what was he like when I was in? When he say no, he just got worse. Sometimes I have to ask the man, well, what was she doing the same time when she just got worse? Yeah, because when you date, you put on the best front, you put on a good coat of paint. After you get married, for some reason, that old coat of paint starts shipping away, and you, you don't put on as much coat of paint no more. You know, I don't know why. I'm letting my wife do what's a little coat of paint. Hallelujah, right? She do it. Okay. Just don't talk to me after a moment. But, but you know what I'm talking about. There are people who fuss and fight all the time, and, and you're going, man, the secretary of war signing your wedding certificate. When you are guarding your heart, you will inspire your spouse to guard their heart as well. And you'll have a partner that will help you in that matter. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 says, Why uh, submit to 
to admit is a military term. When you go out there to, to, to see a military platoon and they holler, um, uh, I don't know what they holler, but anybody can get in line and straighten up and, and come to the table. That's what, that's what I think that's what I'm looking for. And they said, fall in. And you get in there and they said, follow me. Um, you don't have nobody in the back of the I can leave this back of the word submit is a term that means to be on the same team. It's a picture of a military platoon arranging themselves under the one who is the lead into the minefields and the battles that they're going to face. And in, according to God's word, in the marriage, that is to be the man. Sadly, can I say this? And, and, and you still love me? Sadly, in our society, a lot of men have advocated that position. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, as God was pronouncing judgment upon the serpent, and then he moved to the woman before he went to the man, as he was speaking to the woman and pronouncing judgment upon her for her original sin, he flat out told her, you're going to desire to rule over your husband. See, the husband is to be the God-anointed and God-appointed leader of the home, first spiritually and then physically and then materially. But men, listen, you are not the boss of the big stick either. Because God follows up, follows pretty quickly upon after he says in Ephesians 5 22, wives, submit to your husband, line up with him. In Ephesians 5 25, he said, For husband, this means you are to love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God that Jesus Christ does not love the church. Like many men love their wives. If you did that, man, we would be in a whole heap of trouble, wouldn't we? And get too many amen on that. Why not? Maybe they all follow and look at that. See, the best way to guard your heart in a marriage relationship or a dating relationship, can I tell you this? I want you to get, if, 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 you are, if you are married or you are, you are dating someone, and I know we have about some who are not dating, some are dating that said, Dr. Marcus, some said, my mom after, after my dad died, she said, I want no other man. She said, I ain't got time to raise up another one tree that is, and, and learn to make me live by it. Okay? Now, my dad was a great godly man. Now, Jenny's going to say that after I die. Now, she wasn't getting her another man either. She said, I ain't got time to, to take, on, take on another project like you. Praise God. Okay. So, listen here. If you, if you want to have a growing relationship in your marriage, men, women, let me tell you this. Have a love triangle. I want you to get a love triangle. He said, wait a minute, back to town, we're going to get a love triangle. Now, let me, let me talk to you about the love triangle. You know what a triangle is. It's a, it, it's, it's a three-sided object. It has two legs and a bottom, right? And then you got a pillow on the top, two uh, uh, angles on the, on the bottom, and it's a, God's at the top. And so the love of that triangle is going to be you, and, you, God, and your spouse. You're going to be God's at the top. You on one side, your spouse or your boyfriend, girlfriend on the other side. Now here's what happens. If you start, both of y'all start moving closer to God, what's happening? You move closer to each other. And you'll get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger as you make him the center of your life. The center of your dating relationship. That does not mean that you will have a perfect marriage. But it does mean that you will have a covenant in marriage. Because sometimes one leg, or one person will be moving a little faster than the other. And they'll have to get encouraged with the other one. And then you start moving together. Sometimes the other one starts moving a little bit faster than the other. Get encouraged with it. Why? Because you would cover that together. If you are single, and if you are dating, or maybe maybe you're going, well, you know, I'm, I'm not over there. Mom dad said, I can't date that. And, and you spit fire at me. You know, praise God that mom and dad telling you, you're not ready to date yet. Or maybe you've taken yourself off the market. Let me give you a word from the speediest love story you have ever read. The Song of Song. I'll tell you what, Song of Song is pretty stingy. I mean, you're talking about falling in the glasses kind of stuff. Some of you say, no, that's not Christ's church. No, that, that, that's an application of it. But some of Solomon, we see a young couple go grow from liking each other to being in love with each other, to pursuing one another, to, to a hot, steamy, loving marriage. 
And you can't get better than that one. You know, the Orthodox Jews will not let, will not let a boy read Song of Solomon that he's done, he's done marriage because it's that scene to them. It is a lot to them to read it with the eyes that it's a, it is a love story, a pure love story. And in chapter 4, or verse, in, in, I'm sorry, in verse 4 of chapter 8 in the Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 4, it says it one time, it says it several other times during that Song of Solomon, you'll find these words, do not awaken love before it's time. These young lovers in Song of Solomon, they, they knew that once love was let out of the box, it was next to impossible to get back in the box and even keep it under control. Everybody ever played with a jackpot? And that thing popped out? You ever try to get those things back in? Sometimes, sometimes it goes back in like that. But other times, you pop that thing in, and, and you don't know if you've got to lose your religion to say something you shouldn't say. Because, I mean, you might not do it. Get back in there, and it pops back. Song of Solomon is saying, sometimes life can be like a jack in the box. Just talk to control, try to get back in the box. In fact, uh, John Kent said it this way. It was not as funny for you younger people. That's a singer in days gone by. You can Google him. You can YouTube him. You'll find him. And the moment I mention this, some of you older folks that will start singing this song, I'm going to give you a call. I'll call for you to sing in your head for a little bit. I'm going to call you back today. I'll burn the ring of fire. Okay, now, 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 now stop. Let's, let's come back, okay? So let me encourage you. If you are someone who is dating or you are single or you even taking yourself off the market, let me encourage you not to awaken love before it's time. You need to bury your heart, but do not lock it in a tower and throw away the key. Okay? Okay. So let me give you five ways. Let me give you five ways. We're not going to be here in the midnight, I promise you. Let me give you five ways to guard your heart in your marriage and your day or your dating relationship. Not, not married and dating relationship. Once you, you marry, married, you go off the market, you can't do dating no more. Okay? Other than your spouse, okay? So let me, let me give you five ways to guard your heart in your marriage or your dating relationship. Number one, you want to respect the sanctity of marriage. You need to respect the sanctity of marriage. You need to respect the sanctity of your marriage, and you need to respect the sanctity of other people's marriage. That means you don't flirt with your best friend's spouse. That means you don't flirt with someone else other than your spouse. Only your spouse ought to be the ones you flirt with. Only your spouse ought to be you speak nice, sweet platitudes to. Everybody else is off the market on that stuff. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 says, Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to the one to one another in there. And God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. We are to honor our marriage. We are to remain faithful in our marriage. Because see, when you commit adultery, it, it, it wounds deeply and more deeply than any other thing. Some ways that people commit adultery today. We know basically the, the meaning of adultery. You have to say with someone who is not your marriage spouse. We know that. But you know, men, women, when you look at pornography, you committed adultery in your marriage. Because you were longing for somebody that's not yours and not even real. When you have fantasy, fantasy sex with someone else who is not your spouse, you committed adultery. When you need your emotional support and your comfort in the arms of another, whether you are having a sexual relationship with them or not, you are free, you are called in and, and committing adultery. Jesus said to even look muscly after someone other than your spouse is adultery. I like what Billy Graham uh, answered one time when somebody said, Do you, do you, uh, do you not ever? Anyway, he was asked about some pretty long walk across the path. He said something along this line. Not the same look the first time, but the second that when you start Googling, look at the second time, the same comes in. Something on that line. Listen, you can't help but pass before your eyes unless you go see before. But the moment you start doing the doing the cartoon thing, you got eyes popping out your head and your head tongue laying out and your heart beating and everything, and that's somebody that's not your spouse, you done moved into an adult for you. According to Jesus. That's why we need to respect the sanctity of marriage. 
If you want to guard your heart in your marriage or your dating relationship, number two, communicate, 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 and stop wasting your money and your time trying to read their mind. Because it's not working out for you. We have some folks out in the parking lot that I talked to just a few moments ago. They've been married uh, 54, 57 years. Been married a long time. I bet if you would sit down with them and you would say, how many times have you been able to read each other's mind? They would tell you absolutely none. You would think, well, guess what they might be thinking, but there is no way in the world that God's given us the permission to be able to read someone's mind. If you try to read your, your spouse's mind and your daughter's dating life mind, you are to fail every time. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Peter says this. He says, Husbands, you must give honor to your wives, and you treat your wives with understanding as you live together. Uh, she may be weaker than you, but you, but the she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you sh- as you should, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Another translation goes it this way. Live with your wife in an understanding way. Men, first of all, basically what I say is the women you need to understand this because it goes your way too. But he better read, he said, women. When you are to live with your wife or your spouse in an understanding way, that means you need to understand what ticks her off. Makes her go boom. And you also need to know what makes her tick or her like a kid. I should have rather come home and not like her like a kitten than the boom boom going off, okay? We got to laugh about it. I heard that for that. But it's a great sound. Okay. Number three, if you want to guard your heart in your marriage or your dating relationship, number three, make regular deposits of love into each other's love cups. Fill up their love cup. I did not fill up my wife's love cup today. But I did not give her a card or a box of chocolates. My wife's love language is uh, for me to speak to her as acts of service. She wants me to do something for her. You know how to fill up her love cup later on? I had to pull out the grill when I was grilling the section. I had to clean up the clean up kitchen. You talking about filling up her love cup? Woo, baby. Finally, someone won't have nothing on us later on. And that carries to the further point that we talked about just a moment ago. Of, of make sure you communicate. Know what, know what each other's love language is. Karen Chapman identified five love languages of men and women. Acts of service. My wife loves when I do acts of service for her. Spending quality time with. Physical touch. Giving gifts. Words of affirmation. Mine is words of affirmation. That's why she gives me cards and that's why she says, oh, I'm in other languages. When, when you know which love language your spouse is speaking, you can fill their love cup easily. And she will fill yours, or he will fill yours. First John chapter 4, verse 19 tells about God filling our love cup because he says this we love each other, we love each other because he first loved us. He showed us how to pour love in each other's cup. See, without God, as the instigator of your love, the best that you will ever have is a strong life. Unless, unless you surrender your love to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I've known many marriages that started off very rocky. They, they got married for all the wrong reasons and, and everything else decided, you know, we don't want to divorce, we want to stay together. When they start putting God as center of their home, you would have swore God put it together from the beginning. Fourth thing, if you want to guard your heart in your marriage or your dating relationship, give your spouse permission to love God more than you. You need to treasure your relationship as husband and wife more than any other relationship except for God. Jenny knows that she's number two love in my life. And I know I am number two love in her life. And, it's, and number one is not our kids. Number one is 
thou art our love for our God, not for our Heavenly Father. He is number one in our lives. There have been times we, 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 we uh, moved somebody, her up, or she moved me up, and all of that. That's not work good for anyone. Listen, God should be your number one love, and your spouse needs to be number two in your life. If you have a relationship with living, not let me tell you what, your spouse will not be offended to be number two in your life. Because then you're going to be loving her or him as an everlasting love, not an everlasting love. Your relationship with husband and wife, brother, listen to me carefully. Your relationship as husband and wife is more important than your relationship as parent and child. I love my kids. But Jen's got to come first before my kids. And Jen loves our kids, but I've got to come first before my kids, even her. You are to leave your home as parent, not one of the pathways of life with your small best friend. That's one reason we got some messed up family today. Listen, if, 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 if your children are closer to you in relationship than your spouse, your marriage is going to suffer. And one of the things that's going to happen is your kids will not know who to trust nor how to respect authority figures in their life because you burn the line so much for them. And that's why you go, no, John, you can't do that. I'm going to do one. Because he or she did not learn respect and authority. That's why it's important for us as husband and wife to have God word moving together and then passing that on to teaching our children. They don't learn it any other way. But if we mess it up in the home, it messes up in society. And one reason we got we got such a, a messed up society is because the home is broken down. And so if you want to guard your heart and your marriage or your dating relationship. You need to live to a life. You need to love each other as Christ would love them. That couple comes to me one time and that they were spit fire each other. Oh man, they were mad. Man, if she could have picked up bricks and don't see what happened, he had a bad new this morning. I mean, they were mad. And they said, Pastor, you got any words of wisdom for us? How can, how can I? We can smile and I look at him and I said, this I promise you, this is what I said. If you start loving, loving her as Christ will love her, and if you start loving him as Christ will love him, this junkie will start to get passed away. They still marry today, and I love him more than you can because they decided to put Christ first in their relationship. They decided to love each other as Christ will love them, and we've got to do that. First Corinthians chapter 13, the first eight verses is a great model for us. The, the first part it says, if I speak all the languages of men and angels, but I have love, I'm just like a, a noisy called gong. Or if I give myself to be burned in the fire, but I don't have love, then it, why did I profit it anyway? What it's saying it, is that you can love, and you can do acts of love, and you can give gifts of love, but if you do not love, they are saying that you will attempt to buy love. And then he goes on in that wonderful passage in verse 4 that says, Love is patient and love is kind. It does not keep a record of wrong. And it goes on from there. And that's a good lens in which to view your marriage or your dating relationship to it. If you had to, if you had to write down how you were loving your spouse and the one you were dating, could you say, I'm patient with them? I'm not kind with them? Well, what about that today? Sometimes they're feeding off of you. Okay, I, I, I don't need you one extra, okay? Because y'all look like you, you, you're not ready to go, so I don't need you one extra. No charge for this, okay? You don't, you don't even have to back for an extra dollar, okay? This is just no, no charge for this, just uh, for good measures. If you want to build, if you want to guard your heart in your marriage or your dating relationship, then let me encourage you to find two couples that will invest in your marriage or your dating relationship. Find two couples to invest in. Them. One couple needs to be a couple who's been married longer than you have been. Because 
this older couple can help you avoid the minefields and the pitfalls that they fell victim to. So they said, don't stop there. There's a mine right there. Point me in the army. When they were going through the jungles and they were going through the desert, you have a point man in there. And the point man's purpose is to find out where the enemy's sniper fire is going to come from, but also know where the mines are. And an older couple can help you in your relationship. In your relationship minefields. But the other couple I want you to get is a couple who is younger in their relationship than you are. Maybe they have not been married yet, or maybe they have um, only been married just a short time, or they have just begin the stages of love. But you can navigate, help them navigate some things, and you can teach them some stuff. If you, if you were to do these six things, you will guard your heart, especially when it comes to the matter of love. And that's why you marry people. You should be praying for your spouse. And if you're dating, you need to be praying for your future spouse. Don't be like everybody else and just hope it happens. We need to honor God in our relationship because doing so, can I say it this morning? If we will honor God in our relationships, we will save ourselves a whole lot of heartache. And we will save ourselves a whole lot of headache. And bless God, we will even save ourselves a whole lot of money. But if you get it wrong, it's going to cost you some dough. Pray with me. Father God, I thank you for showing us how to love one another based upon your love for us. Father, I thank you for my spouse. I thank you for Jenny and the love that we share and the marriage that we've shared for 31 years. I thank you, God, for those in our family of, of, of believers here, those in George Baptist Church, that are, that are married. I want to thank you for those who had wonderful marriage, that even though their spouses might have passed away right now, I want you to remind them how much their marriage was and how great it was and, and remind them of the good times. Yes, we all have some bad times and some tough times, but Father, remind them of the good times and also remind them of the love that they shared not only with each other, but with you. And Father, I thank you for, that in our congregation there are those who are dating or, and others who are looking to date. And may we honor you in all that we do as we date and as we marry. I pray, Almighty God, that, that you will bring a fresh spark in the lives of our married couples. I pray that you will help those who are dating to not awaken your love before it's time. And Almighty God, I ask simply that our relationship with others will be, our, will be a reflection of our relationship with you. And God, the only way we know how to pray is coming to your throne, pouring out our needs. Interceding for one another and doing just what Jesus said, come in the name of Jesus. And that's what we've done today. And we ask that you honor and that you'll magnify yourself in our midst and bless our relationships. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Just one more second. Why should he love me so? Amen. Let's just stand as we sing. Love sent my Savior to
we pray for those that are sick. We pray for those that have, have lost loved ones. Uh, so many recently in our area. Father, we just pray for them. 